Welcome to the Visual K podcast. I'm your host, Frederick, also known as Whirling Black. And with me today, I have... you got your co-host, Alexi. And I'm your podcast producer and editor, James, also known as Plant Online. Boy, did, did we have a lot of yeah. trouble with, <laughs> oh, well. with our last episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh, it's that the was uh, sh- sophomore slump. What? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Well, like you know, when the second album is bad, you're, it's called the sophomore slump, isn't it? I've never. Oh, I've oh, never the heard sophomore, of that. The sophomore slump. Yeah. Okay, I misheard you. I thought you said the self more slump, and I was like, "What is that?" <laughs> <laughs> the self more slump. All right. Wow. Yeah, not that one. Okay. Yeah, no, I've, <laughs> I'm. I'm. Uh, yeah, I was. I'm just happy we got this episode out. To be honest, I. I, I was kind of despairing for a bit uh, when I heard how badly the recording had fucked up in some places. <laughs> yeah. So we recorded. We recorded it pretty early on, and I was like, oh, okay, this is going to be great. I'm going to have the whole two weeks to edit it, and nothing's going to go wrong. But um, so the way we record episodes is everyone records their own voice um, locally at home, and then I just sync the tracks together. But some of those local recordings were damaged, so we just like couldn't use them, and we had to retake the episode. And this time, for the second take, we used a Discord bot, because we record the episodes on Discord. Um, we use a Discord bot named Craig that records us. I don't know why it's called Craig, but it is. <laughs> but I know that Craig really fucked us over. Yeah. <laughs> records our voices individually. So I thought like, okay, if, if our tracks get messed up, I at least have those uh, Discord individual tracks. But Craig disconnected in the middle of our recording. And just like the recordings <laughs> did not sync up well. So it was just like, for the second take, I literally just had to use the uh, the rec- the track I recorded like during the session just the raw session of all of us on one track so i apologize for that you got discord sounds in the middle of uh the episode and had all that discord compression on our voices but you know yeah i think Uh, you did a good job about the podcast when even the bot doesn't want to be our (laughs) audience yeah Yeah, good point (laughs) Yeah, but I think it. Uh, I th- yeah, I think it speaks volumes that you managed to get an episode out of it despite everything. So I mean, I think we are quite happy just not having to do a third take of this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think like we we talked about it. And we're just like, yeah, I can't do a third take. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, y- yeah, and uh, it was kind of weird because we had a server event on the Rare Discord server planned, like a quiz based on the episode. Uh, the, the previous episode obviously and it wasn't out by the time the quiz happened so the sort of relevance of the questions became totally uh, well nothing I irrelevant. suppose there was no yeah irrelevant <laughs> exactly that's the word I was looking for because I mean I, I choose like songs that we t- talked about or featured uh, more prominently during the podcast to be on the <laughs> on the quiz but then the then the podcast wasn't out yet so they had nothing to go on it's funny still how people actually did better than when we were featuring new visual k bands on the uh first quiz yeah they did really well actually yeah the top score was 11 out of 15 and it was two people who had the same score so we had to do like a a tiebreaker yeah (laughs) and the funny part is that i choose what i thought was the most Fame or one of the most famous uh, Visual K songs from the late 1980s as the tiebreaker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll never let this go. And then none of them knew it. They were like, "Who the hell is this? What is this?" Yeah. So the tiebreaker question is just like we play a song and whoever gets it first wins, and it's just like, yeah. the most popular song, and no one got it. So we had to play another song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It was uh, "Shade" by Luna C which according oh. to me is very popular at least yeah <laughs> it's popular in the frederick household <laughs> <laughs> yeah no in, i mean it's the... a demo version yeah. i can see how that would throw you off because it probably took me a good few years until i even realized that uh, lunacy even has demos yeah I, I i guess it's not that prominent because the first album is so popular you sort of don't really realize they had anything before that yeah and also the breakdown is very different uh, yeah, it's a lot slower also. I think the speed of it is more similar to the re-recording they made in 2011. Uh, but sorry, like this, is not a, <laughs> this is not a Luna C <laughs> podcast, I'm sorry. It's not <laughs> Frederick's favorite songs podcast. Yeah, yeah, well, exactly. Actually, it kind of is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it, it happens when you're the host. You kind of get to choose what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> 
so anyway, the topic of today's episode is the very popular band uh, Malis Miser, Malis Miser, Malis Marisu Miseru. How do you say it, guys? <laughs> Malice Miser is a name I'm really afraid to say because um, as a native English speaker, uh, Malice Miser is most intuitive for me to say. But then I think like, no, it's a Japanese band, so it should probably be Malice Miser. And it's neither, right? It's Malice Miser. Yeah, because it's, you know, based on malice and misery. Yeah. Well, as a native Finnish speaker, you can only go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think that's, that's trying to just read... Uh, English words in katakana when it's not even written in katakana is kind of, yeah, I don't say diruan gurei either. It's just, no, no it's I not for me. I honestly think that it's pretty blowhardish to try to pronounce everything like exactly uh, the way that, let's say, people from that country pronounce it. Yeah, I mean, for like native Japanese words, I make an effort for it, but I, I'm yeah, not going, I mean, I'm not going to try to try, uh, Try, uh, translate Jesus Christ. I'm not going to try to um, pronounce that's what I'm not going to try to pronounce uh, English words in a Japanese accent just to you know emulate Sorry, the I bands. actually think that you should definitely try to translate it. Yeah. <laughs> so today yeah. we're going to talk about the black dream. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. The, the gray coin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah i agree with you if it's a foreign word like if it's an uh english word then i'm not gonna pronounce it with a japanese like katakana accent that's bizarre um but i think it's just like uh the word miser like i don't know i don't know what that it looks like a foreign word to me even though it doesn't look japanese so i'm just very like confused by it when i see it isn't there a word like actually though a legit word that is miser like someone who is stingy with money a or miser. something like that yeah yeah Oh, it's a miser. It is a miser, but it's yeah. written with an S and not a Z. Yeah. Ah, oh, right. Yeah. 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 But the thing is, like, we as a humanity have hundreds of years, if not thousands of years of a history of localization. So I'm not going to, you know, change that now. I mean, even, <laughs> like, a perfect example is um, how Finnish people speak Swedish, even if they're native speakers. Yeah. They pronounce it with a very heavy Finnish accent. And it's just as valid as Swedish from Stockholm. Uh, absolutely, yeah, that is true. Anyway, we have a saying, which is that a child that is loved has many names. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so you you might hear multiple pronunciations of this band's name today, but uh, hopefully you will um, have some uh, sympathy for our tries at least to get it correct. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, before we start the discussion on the music, we're just going to give you guys a quick recap about the band and their sort of general history and discography. So that's coming up right now. Malus Miser was formed by Mama and Koji in August of 1992, recruiting vocalist Tetsu and drummer Gas shortly thereafter. They put out their first demo tape, Sans Logique, in October of that same year, which despite the band having a vocalist at the time, consisted entirely of instrumental songs. The first release that featured the entire band was the track Speed of Desperate, released in February of 1993 on the omnibus CD Brain Trash. Soon after that, Gas left the band to join Euclid Romans, switching places with their drummer Kami, who joined Malice Miser instead as a support drummer. He became a full member in June of the same year. During this year they also released two more demo tapes, Sadness in April and The Firth Anniversary in October. In July 1994, the band released their first full-length album, Memoir, and did extensive touring in support of it. On Christmas Eve of the same year, they released a deluxe version of the album called Memoir DX with a bonus track Baroque, later one of the most popular tracks of the Tetsu era. On the 27th of December, vocalist Tetsu officially left the band after doing one last show. 
The band was then dormant for a while, until they recruited vocalist Gacht, previously of Kane's Feel, as their new vocalist. They did their first live with this lineup on the 10th of September 1995, and in December they released their first single called Uruvashiki Kamen no Shotayo. 1996 was a busy year for the band. In June they released their second full-length album, Voyage Sans Retour, and toured extensively throughout the year, including fan club only events. In October they released the single Ma Chérie, an old song previously performed with Tetsu but never released. But now with Gakt on vocals of course. It's one of the few songs that have been performed live by all three vocalists of the band. The first months of 1997, the band again spent touring heavily for the Voyage album. Then in April, they announced that they were making their major debut the same year, joining Nippon Colombia in July. They then released their first major singles, two versions of Bel Air in August and September, and then Au Revoir in December. 1998 was what many would consider the peak of their fame, starting it off in February with the release of the Gekka no Yasuo Kyoku single, and then finally their first and only major album, Merve. Later in the year they also released two more singles based on the tracks on the album, Illuminati in May and Le Ciel in September. In January of 1999 they announced that vocalist Gakt had left the band, and in June drummer Kami died suddenly of a brain hemorrhage. He was after this point credited as an eternal blood relative and not replaced for the remaining years of activity. In September, the band announced that they had returned to their own indie label, Medinet, run by Mana, and released some instrumental songs on the singles Saikai no Shi Tobara in November and Shinwa in February of the following year, which was a tribute to Kami. In August of 2000, they released their final full-length album, Bara no Seido, and a few days later, at a concert at the Nippon Budokan, announced that vocalist Klaha had officially joined the band. The band released their final singles run in 2001, consisting of Gardenia, Beast of Blood, Mayunaka ni Kawashita Yakusoku, and finally Garnet, as well as a feature film called Bara no Konrei. In December of 2001, the band went on hiatus, which has lasted to this day except for two revival concerts in 2017, where the band performed with their old roadies as vocalists, as none of the original vocalists were able to, or wanted to, participate. Okay, so let's get started with the sort of first era of the band when they had Tetsu as the vocalist. Um, personally, my favorite era of the band. Uh, it was for their demo tapes as well as the first album memoir. A uh, quick word on the demos at first. Uh, Sons Logique is very interesting. Yeah. Especially for the year that it came out. It's kind of like an outsider record in Visual K at the time, I think. Um, it's very raw, spooky. <clears throat> Yeah, extremely raw and uh, very atmospheric, but I think also it stands out that it's songs that sound like they're written for um, vocals, but there are no vocals on the actual songs. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I guess they were already sort of blowing up in the club circuit, so they just need to put out something. Yeah, because the thing is that they definitely had a vocalist at the time when this was uh, recorded, so I'm not sure what happened there. Probably the same that happened to the last episode of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, they recorded his vocals for all the songs and then they were like, shit, we couldn't afford another cassette tape to record record on. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. We accidentally overdubbed your vocals. Sorry. Yeah, I do love the uh, very compressed uh sound, especially on bad rips. The guitar tone sounds like icicles. It's great. 
Yeah, I feel like bad compression can actually do something really fun and interesting to instruments a lot of yeah the i'm all about that yeah sounds cool yeah I, I agree like especially for this kind of very atmospheric uh also tape recording so you have that sort of f tape hiss in the background as well it definitely adds to the feeling of it and i think that the the second demo tape the sadness one the song is very unique yeah that's the one that they salvaged from this one and Sadness is fantastic. I think it's actually one of their best songs overall. It's probably the most gothic thing they <laughs> did. It's a very uh, untypical song for the band as well. They didn't do anything like it after or before. Well, yeah. before, there wasn't really much room before that, but you know. <laughs> yeah, but they definitely started the band with that in mind because it was already on Sans the Geek, just Sans the Vocals. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sans the Vocals. That's good. Uh... Yeah, exactly. And there's also uh, something that's kind of interesting, though, is actually that their uh, omnibus release, uh, Brain Trash, was released before this demo tape. Uh, oh. so, their, so their CD track, Speed of Desperate, from uh, the Brain Trash omnibus was out already in uh, February of, two, of uh, 93. And I think this one was in like April, so it was two months before. And it actually, oh. it's the only recording except Sans Logique that has gas on the drums. Uh, do you remember what other bands that VA has? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> I, remember, right, I, remember, I remember we uh, had a list for it last time, but I think there was uh, literally no one interesting except the Pias, I think, was on it. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, you know what? That's possible. Uh, the band did start touring with very interesting bands very early, like Bizer and CM Shade. Uh, yeah, it's hard to imagine when you look at later eras that they would play with that kind of bands, but yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Well, they really grew so big that they it probably didn't benefit them to play with anyone. Yeah, they grew extremely quickly. Like, even in the Tetsu era, you could see their progress from live houses, like from very small places to quite big ones, only over a period of two years. Yeah, and that does take us to Memoir, which was big of a hit enough to release Memoir DX afterwards. What is the difference between the DX version? Is it like Link's Awakening DX? <laughs> it has one extra <laughs> song. It has the track Baroque uh, tacked on at the end, which was apparently not finished in time for the release of the regular edition. But since Tetsu was leaving the band, I suppose they wanted to put out all the material they had with him. This track is very necessary. I don't even recognize the version without it. Yeah, me neither. I think I think the DX version is certainly the superior one because the rest isn't re-recorded or remastered or anything like that. I believe it's just that there's an extra track at the end, which is one of their longest tracks. I believe it's over seven minutes long and it's very, very progressive and very aggressive. Yeah, and that does take us to the style of the album, which it kind of does already have all those Malice Misery Sam like staples. Um, eclectic genre experimentation in the middle one of the tracks they would reuse later obviously on the third album and um, yeah manas riffing style having a lot of classical music flourishes and, and some violins and piano sampled as well right yeah so it's it is kind of like a chamber music-esque atmosphere at times yeah i think the difference compared to the later stuff though is that it also has that sort of early goth rock uh, feel to it which the later albums lack yeah definitely uh, and also it helps that tetsu has a a gothic tenor i guess if that's a word in his vocals <laughs> i mean sometimes he sounds like a cat in heat especially in the more rocking tracks uh, i think he's fantastic full disclosure me and frederick <laughs> both have the hipster opinion this is their best album and he's the best vocalist yeah, uh, that's a spoiler for the end we were going to talk about, which were our favorites. Oh, but sorry. Yeah. <laughs> now it's all right, it's all right. We, we can just motivate it again at the end, just, you know, you know, hammer it in. Yeah, well, speaking of full disclosure, James, what do you think? <laughs> I'm looking over my notes, and I wrote down, this sounds like either a carnival or a funeral. I don't know if that was for the whole album or certain songs. I think it was like almost oh, the whole it. album. It makes sense to me. What? It makes sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I, I, I get what you mean, I suppose. I always felt like an al album like Merve was more of a 
like a carnival album, like a song like Gekka no Yasokyoku is very uh, carnival-esque to me, like something you would play at the circus. Yeah, uh, well, that album reminds me of a, like a music box. Yeah, so you that know, is you true. turn yeah. the thing and shit comes out. And <laughs> I think that was sort of one of the formative ideas of Malice Misery in general. And I can hear it already in here as well, just in a very sort of raw, uh, early visual K form. Yeah, and I think also it's interesting to note the sort of uh, duality between the guitarists. Like, uh, Mana has a very specific sensibility with his very uh, neoclassical influences. And then you have uh, Koji, who does songs like Seraph on this album, which sort of stands out in its very pop-esque sound almost. Which is something that they would definitely pursue later, more than yeah. in here. Yeah, definitely. I think that Mana soaked up some of that as well for a while. Certainly for Merve, at least. Yeah, I have to throw the ball back to James. What do you think of the vocalist? Um, well, okay, so controversial opinion for you guys, I think. I think this is my least favorite vocalist. <laughs> yeah, that is not a very controversial opinion like in no, the general I, public. Yeah, you're, you're definitely in the majority there, I think. And also, I think it's, you know... N neither me or Alexi had him as our favorite the first hundred times we listened to this band. Yeah, definitely uh, not. It, it's something that has come over the years. We just sort of gravitated towards his style of singing. I started out with a gigant like sorry, I started out as a gigantic Gact fan. Uh, not not a fan of his solo career, but definitely a fan of his uh, performances on Malice Miser stuff. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it was very also because it was very accessible. In the early days, you could find the kind of like low resolution rips of the Merve era uh, music videos and stuff like that. Yeah, and the live performance as well was widely distributed on YouTube. Uh, yeah. But now times have changed and you can find a lot of bootlegs from Tetsuera, uh, Malice mm -hmm. Miser, including yeah. their last live with him. And then, yeah, just some very, very random club concerts. Uh, shot with a camcorder in the audience and they are all amazing. He's an incredible live performer, I think. Yeah, I think it's definitely something that's wor worth watching for people. Yeah, it also shows how eclectic uh, Mana is in showing one of the gigs with like a um, Meline Farmer song, which is probably <laughs> something that other, other Visual K bands at that time didn't do. Uh, yeah, I, I, I doubt it. Uh, it's kind of like a tangent, but I just have to mention that I was watching uh, uh, Alien Mariage and uh, Phobia live stream the other day, and uh, their intro music was Rammstein. Oh, yeah. see, that, <laughs> so, that's that's the fucking thing that Visual K did, which I don't like. We started with cool music, and now we're at this like <laughs> mixture of dad new metal and <laughs> like goth industrial i don't mean like 80s industrial culture industrial i mean like that mall industrial <laughs> yeah i mean I, to be honest i've been to a lot of gigs in japan i i've rarely if ever enjoyed the background music i think so sometime like there was uh i think for gigs with the band dish they used to do like early the cure and kuroyum and stuff like that for their uh, entrance music so that was pretty cool but other than that it's usually garbage yeah, but Dish are a bunch of nerds. Yeah, exactly. They're not representative at all for the scene in general. <laughs> Thank you. 
I get so triggered by the way Gag to butchers the lyrics. <laughs> yeah, he can't really pronounce the English. Like no, uh, not at all. <laughs> I, I think it's like, are, "Are you missing me?" Is that what they're supposed to sing? Yeah. Yeah, that's actually, that's what I think he says, yeah. And uh, I think Gakts, yeah, because when Tetsu sings it, you can actually hear what the lyrics are, but when Gaktus is like, are you me, shoo me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah he tries. Like yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, so we're moving on now to the, I suppose, the most uh, popular era of the band when they had Gaktus the vocalist. But uh, it's pretty easy to just think about the sort of uh, 97 98 period when they had the the big hits the the major contract and stuff but they actually started out still being uh, an indie band but at the time he joined and they did a lot of club touring in 97 and uh, 95 sorry 95 and stuff like that uh, and their earliest stuff with him like the uh, Urushiki Kamen no Shotaijo single and the Voyage album definitely sounds a bit like the Tetsu era in some ways. Yeah, definitely. And also speaking to how big they were, in, how big they were in the club scene, uh, Gak is recruited from a band that sounds a lot like early Malice Miser. And at this time, you also <laughs> have Lara in it, which also sounds like Malice Miser. So they were definitely not nobodies. And they almost recruited a fan, I think, into the band. Yeah, it's it's possible. I, I, I'm not going to speculate on that, but it, it might very well be that they played gigs together with this previous band or something like that. Oh, no, I mean, like, they legitimately sound like a knockoff. Kane's feelings. Uh, <laughs> but didn't a lot of the bands at the time sound like that? I mean, if you listen to early Bicer, it's very similar as well. Oh, I, I don't know. I think early Larain and Kane's feel are just like a... It's a different category. <laughs> straight, straight off, just uh, carbon copy. No, I mean, I mean that's cool though. Uh, yeah, we didn't have too yeah. many of those bands, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, but anyway, like on Voyage, they're already like expanding their horizons a lot. It's a very um, mixed bag. Yeah. Maybe not like I uh, as far as the quality goes, but like this is the first album with a stereotypical Kersey song. There's a Tetsuera leftover, kind of like an unvisual K rock piece. I mean, like totally not rock at all, like Transylvania. Mm. So, and then the Bossa Nova experimentation. I understand why this album is very appealing to some people, just because it's like, again, very eclectic. Yeah, I think that my, my problem with it is that it feels like an album that is sort of stuck in between two eras, so it becomes eclectic, but I think it's not always a good thing. It also feels a bit unfocused to me. Like, for example, um, you have those Tetsu leftover songs like uh, Shinobuto and Sencho, which were actually played with Tetsu before he left. And then also a song like Tsuyoki no Kakira, which definitely also sounds like something written for Tetsu. And then you have like super gakti songs like Premier Amour and Madrigal and Itsuare no Muset and stuff like that. Yeah, I actually think the Tetsu era songs are really, really cool. Gakti is just not Tetsu, so it <laughs> takes a little bit out from them, uh, from me personally. But the other stuff, yeah, it's cool, but it's nowhere near as refined as what comes after this album. Yeah, that's interesting. I actually wrote down that I, I liked the Tetsu era songs uh, the most. I think Tsuyoku no Kakira, I wrote down. It's pretty good. It's catchy. Yeah, the riffs are very cool. Yeah, which yeah is the... even more unfortunate that this is the time when they <laughs> start slowly getting rid of riffs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, though. I mean, I liked Premiere Amour a lot, too, and that's a Gact song. No, I like all this stuff. Like, it's a good Yeah. Album. I mean, I mean, technically, I mean, all of them are Gakt songs on here, but yeah. I mean, you can tell that, for example, like Tsuyoku no Kakira has that uh, like twin guitar riffing, yeah. which really didn't happen in the Gakt era, except on like a few, like Bel Air, for example, has it, but it might be one of the only ones. Yeah, and if you find a bootleg where Gakt attempts to sing some of these songs, you realize that he really can't. Uh, yeah, especially when you hear, when you hear him trying to sing the Tetsu songs, like I heard lives of uh, of him doing seraph and baroque and stuff, and it's just he's really really straining his voice trying to reach those notes. 
uh, conspiracy theory. I think the reason why the DVD, sorry, the uh, gig from this era, which made it onto a VHS, it doesn't have the entire set list. Maybe that's one of the reasons. <laughs> Yeah, they cut like half the songs, and most of the songs remaining only are featured in uh, half length or something like that. Yeah, it might that's also... unfortunate. It's still a document, you know, so it would be nice to have the entire thing. But at least we have Japanese bootleggers, so... Yeah, I mean, it was certainly filmed, I think, so I, it doesn't make sense. I mean, they could milk some money out of that if they used to release the uncut gig. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you just don't turn the cameras off. Like, guys, I think we got enough for the fans. <laughs> yeah, especially when it's like half songs from the whole set. You know that they filmed the whole thing. They're not going to turn on the camera for half a minute and then turn it off. Yeah, or the same thing <laughs> happened to the recording as to our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Again. <laughs> All this is plagued by technical difficulties. <laughs> I mean, it's possible. I mean, I think there was the... I think Deer and Grey lost their whole tour footage in some kind of uh, Oh, yes, from a cover, I think. Yeah, that's what I... From what I remember, at least. I bet that's that tragic. Silent Tower is going to... Era. Yeah, but Solentau is going to write the pod now and complain that we got this completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it was the Macabre. But anyway, yeah. like also about like how sort of unrefined this album is compared to the next one is that some of the stuff really sounds like music that would be playing in a Poké Center, like real PS1 vibes on some of this shit, like especially no pains, no gains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's a very much a Koji song, I believe. Yeah, definitely. It's one of his early attempts at doing the electronic stuff. Yeah, I think we'll, we've decided that all in all, it's a pretty nice, fun album. Yeah. Uh, that's it, sort it, of it, this band sort of spreading its wings, I guess, for the first time. Yeah, I think it's struggling with the consistency, but the songs individually are all fine. I, I, I wouldn't rate this a bad album in any way. It's a, it's a solid album. It's just n not something I would consider like a... How do you say like a like a top album? Yeah, like a masterpiece, exactly. Yeah, yeah, definitely, and that's probably why it gets the shaft a little bit compared to the uh, third album. Uh, I love the album <laughs> cover, though. Uh, yeah. The yeah. album cover is like something that you would find at like a second-hand store with random CDs, and it's like Christmas music from Yo Yo. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, it does. I can see that. Yeah, so I I think that's the progression from there to uh, Merve is kind of <clears throat> not completely obvious, but if you look at those songs I labeled gacked tracks from the last album, I think you could kind of see where it was leading. You could definitely connect the dots. Yeah, like a song like Premier Amour, for example, in an updated version could fit on this album without a problem. I think uh, Transylvania is also building up to Sunicus. Oh, yeah. I could, I could see that in some way. Uh, but yeah, this was obviously when they were at their peak in po in popularity in Japan. So it's, I think this is also the album most people have strong feelings for because it's the one they were exposed to first, most likely at least. Uh, unless they were like hardcore into Moi de Moi or something and then they heard uh, Barano Seido or something first. But I would suspect that uh, Merve is most people's introduction to Malus Miser. So I, I would say that this album is, compared to the previous one, extremely consistent throughout. Like, this is an album I can definitely put on back to back and feel like all the songs belong together in some way. Yeah, I mean, dude, it's all hits. Legitimately, it's hits from top to bottom. The production is airtight. Uh, there's a lot of elements, just like you can tell that they got a budget. If they didn't have it for yeah. the last two, they definitely got it for this one. And the PV budget is also out of this world. Yeah, and I think that helps, the, like helps uh, the reason why people are so attached to this album. Because, like I mentioned earlier, the PVs for the songs on this album are all iconic in Visual K. Like all of Visual K, they're iconic. And yeah, and it was just very. I think a lot of kids our age when we got into VK were very attracted to this sort of edgy and bloody image they had going there. Uh, funny story, this was obviously one of my first Visual K bands, and um, the first thing I saw was the Sunicus Live with Gact walking down the ramp in his uh, Sun King costume. I thought it was awesome, and I still <laughs> don't know why I like it as much as I do, because he has terrible hair in it. He's, it's completely gelled up. It's like small <laughs> sticks of hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, And yeah. for some reason, I thought he looked so cool, and now I just, I just can't. Also, his vanilla hair is terrible. 
it's yeah. complete shit but everyone just went like oh it looks like cloud from final fantasy 7 like <laughs> no it doesn't <laughs> oh wait wasn't there was a final fantasy character based on gact right yeah, yeah it's the dude from dirge of cerberus uh vincent is it that does it? i thought it was um nah uh squall from final no, fantasy squall is from eight no that's not based on him is it i think that's just fan rumor yeah, it, does Squall even look like Gak, though? Okay, I just looked it up, and you're right. Gak is a character in um, Dirge of Cerberus. He plays a uh, someone named Genesis Rhapsodos. Fuck it. Cheese City. Jesus <laughs> Christ. <laughs> it's, uh, it's also kind of funny that his uh, character's name was like almost like two glam rock bands from the West. Isn't Gen isn't Genesis some kind of Western oh, glam rock band? Yeah, that's right. They are. Well, and and like I think prog rock, isn't it? Yeah, that might be. Yeah, and I think Rhapsody is also some kind of Western dad rock band. Uh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they used made a gacked character named after two dad rock bands. Oh, should have been the priest maiden. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, I guess you could say that the band definitely hit their peak with this album, like Merve. And there's also so many different kinds of songs on it like you have those that one song with riffs bel air which definitely has some rock feeling to it might even be like proto sort of kamijo uh, stuff in a way i think Lorena does take a few things from this album in general yeah uh yeah. bel air obviously has that sort of classic uh malice miser riffing but then like mm. the um, remake from memoir and lucille have also they do have a guitar it's yeah. that middle memoir type of style if you know what i'm saying mm. yeah and uh yeah I th and uh i think lucille was the only song that gakt wrote uh, for this album and it also turned out to be their biggest selling uh, single they ever made so my kind of uh, guess is that this is when the record label had hunted him for a solo career. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, that they just came and pulled from his sleeve and said, like, dude, you want to bail? And he was like, well, how much are you going to pay? <laughs> uh, you know what song really stood out to me? Uh, Brees, I think, is that how you say it? Uh, track five. That one is really poppy and just like very, I don't know, radio friendly. And it kind of took me off guard when it when it kicked on. I was like, oh, is this like the same band? Yeah, it speaks to the diversity, I guess. And it has a fun life as well. We're just kind of dancing around the stage. and Yeah, and I, and I think it's kind of interestingly sandwiched in between Illuminati and Ege. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, because Illuminati is obviously kind of a very... How would you describe it? Like dark, wavy kind of sound to it. I guess it's Kersey's finest moment. Yeah, in, in this band at least, certainly. Yeah. One of them. I mean, I still prefer Seraph, but you know, that's just me. Ah, well, actually, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know what? I might be on the boat as well, but it's a cool track. Uh, yeah. Also, actually, um, S Conscious. Oh, okay. I was literally just about to mention that. Can we talk about that track? Because at a certain point, it just like breaks into... It sounds like people having sex. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I wanted to mention. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it's definitely a very, very strange track. Uh, yeah, I think can... it actually sort of prefaces the next album. It has that sort of pummeling, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, in, yeah. In, in a way, definitely, I, I can see that. Uh, like it's a hint, hint of the future direction. And uh, sex wasn't a hint of future direction. <laughs> uh, yeah uh, yeah and i was going to say also that i i think that this album is um, people often see it as the most representative album of the band but i would probably argue it's the strange one out if you compare it to their other three albums it's the most uh, stylistically different yeah definitely it's the most diverse and uncharacteristically i guess very good studio production Overall, just a really professional job. Yeah, and it also has that distinct sort of pop appeal to it, which is the other albums don't. Yeah, I mean, this is, first of all, this is the only album it hits. Well, uh, you could say that the late singles with Klaha are also hits. Um, yeah. But otherwise, it's not like anyone goes to in a party and says can say to you, like, can you play random track from Voyage? No, that would never happen. <laughs> Actually, I've had requests at the club for Madrigal, 
so yeah but i guess that's the only one that's a very strange crowd <laughs> <laughs> i don't know people used to like it what can i say um yeah so uh, james did you have any final impressions you wanted to share on this album since you're the one who was the most fresh to it uh no i don't think so <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, we, we already covered uh, your standout tracks i guess yeah i think so okay yeah so uh, uh, let's move on then to the next period Okay, so something that's worth mentioning, like I did in the introduction, is that uh, between Gakt leaving and this new vocalist joining, the drummer Kami died, so the sound took a turn quite for the darker, as you could hear in the sample towards the end. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, this album is impossible to like not listen to through the prism of Kami's death and Gakt's betrayal. Yeah. It definitely, it kind of feels like the whole album is one long sort of uh, funeral eulogy of some kind. Yeah, although I have to say, I was just reading through my notes, and it actually says, through the prism of Mana's death. <laughs> <So> <laughs> it's a lot darker than what actually happened. Wow, M Mana's death. Jesus. Yeah, Mana is still alive, unfortunately. Yeah. It was God that died. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's probably one of the most unconventional albums I've ever heard under the Visual K moniker and it's all the more impressive that it comes from a band that was just recently making the big bucks and performing on big stages uh, with Gact. and yeah then they just did like a you could almost call it a 180 there is very little premonition of the style of this album yeah and also you can't really pick out hits from this album this is a sort of thematic album that you probably would hear from start to finish <laughs> Yeah, there is like a few songs, like which would be sort of traditionally considered like song songs in Visual K. But then there's a lot of stuff that sort of sounds like an interlude that's just extended. And it's very it's very dreary in some ways. It's very the atmosphere is kind of oppressive almost and even though it's very bombastic and large. Yeah, it made me feel like I was going to fight a boss in a Final Fantasy game. <laughs> I, I guess in a way they were sort of doing that. I mean, first of all, it's absolutely a commercial suicide. Uh, yeah, I mean, coming off the back of uh, Mervey, they could easily just have gotten a sort of good pop vocalist and done another album just like it. And they, they could probably have already could have gotten the dollar store gacked in Yuka. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, they could certainly have found someone. I mean, even Claha could obviously do like more poppy songs like you hear on gardenia for example yeah i mean as he did later on for sure uh i guess they just had to get this out of their system yeah and i think it's worth mentioning also they released uh, a few a few uh short cds uh instrumental cds between the departure of gakt and uh, the arrival of klaha with this album uh, like uh, Sakai no Chi Tobara and uh, Shinwa, perhaps it's called. Yeah, I think the Shinwa one was released as uh, a tribute to Kami. Yeah, it came a part of some box or something like this, right? 
Yeah, I believe so. It was in some kind of special box. Yeah, it has three three instrumental tracks. Yeah, I gotta say though, still like I'm not exactly a fan. I'm sort of a fan in spirit, but not in fact. Uh, it's yeah. dangerously close to being pretty tedious, and also this is the time when Mana sort of starts the rest of his career. He introduces <laughs> this tremolo picked metal riffing that I just cannot stand for the most part. Uh, a lot of harpsichord, which <laughs> coincidentally I also can't stand. Uh, and organs. Yeah, well, organs are cool. Like uh, to be honest, like yeah. again, like if this album was like a complete one-off, I think yeah. I would like it more than now with the lingering thought that MDM lo- <laughs> is going to be like all this. And yeah, it, led to tw- it led to it led to twenty years of variations of this album. Yeah, which is super <laughs> weird, <laughs> considering that like he might have us innovating the yeah. entire Malice Mister career up to this point. Yeah. Uh, but I would say that this album, taken on its own, is quite inventive for Visual K. Yeah, it's definitely. very unconventional, and. I appreciate the efforts, but I, I'm not going to say it's one of my favorite albums or anything, but I really appreciate the effort and that the fact that it exists makes me happy, but I'm not going to put it on. Yeah, I also think <laughs> I, I also think the same. Uh, I respect them a lot as musicians for making this. Yeah, I think I kind of feel the same way. It's something I like the idea of more than I actually like uh, enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that uh, it, it, I would have to be in a very certain mood for it and I would have to feel like I had the time and willpower to sit through the entire thing because I can't I can't imagine myself sitting down and going like okay I'm going to listen to track six today yeah I mean you could also say that the main event is kind of already in the beginning so it shows its entire hand already almost at the start so like when you're three tracks in in a way you've sort of seen everything already so it's just sort of more of that same but when you're going through like the first two tracks you're like this is really fucking epic but there's only yeah. so much epic that you can take <laughs> yeah i think track two actually is a good representation of the entire album almost it has a lot of the different segments that feature uh and in the different songs yeah i agree with that i think like once it kind of establishes itself it just kind of sticks to that and plays it safe essentially it's not there aren't any surprises once you kind of get used to the sound. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the live DVD is, well, VHS, I think it was. But <laughs> it's also that. And it's like an hour and a half long, I think, an hour and 20 minutes. And yeah, it's really cool as an idea. But sitting through the entire thing, that's that's a tall order for me when I'm not that big of a fan. Yeah, and it has this awful version of Kyoku to Sora as well. Oh, we're which, the only uh, people in the world with that opinion, by the way. Everyone else seems to love yeah. it, but I'm also not a fan at all. Yeah, it's very funny because like I remember uh, back in the day, apparently in the in the Visual K Club, uh, people would specifically request uh, the the Kalaha version live like ripped to mp3 to play during the club yeah oh i don't uh, know (laughs) yeah they're entitled to their opinion as i am yeah of course yeah of course but yeah of course they are i mean but i I just don't like that they he changed the entire vocal melody and the text and everything yeah i absolutely cannot stand the change and i think klaha's voice is actually the best served in these pop songs which they would do like gardenia he's yeah wonderful in it yeah, I think we should probably mention that, yeah, like, after this album, it felt like they had, like, a new cycle going on, like, with Beast of Blood and Gardenia and Garnet, they kind of, like, already had the next album sound planned out, and it would have been so cool to hear where that album would have gone, because it's it's more like the earlier stuff, but with Claw. Yeah, it actually kind of would have been, like, a meta way to this album. If that makes sense, yeah. sort of a yeah. super, uh, like an eclectic, well-produced pop album. More, more accessible, like yeah. it's an album where you could pick out individual songs and say, let's put on this one. Yeah, less of a statement and <laughs> more like yeah. a, an album yeah. <laughs> of songs. But Yeah, but obviously it, it wasn't meant to be and they disbanded shortly after the release of uh, the third one, Garnet. 
so it's it's kind of sad that that promise was left unfulfilled and I cannot see the band releasing anything today because I mean Klaha is long gone and the others have sort of I mean when they do a Malice Misery live no one is going to want to hear a new song <laughs> they they want the, if they're doing reunions or something they want the old stuff yeah I mean I guess it kind of depends how they would pull it off but it started to look like they will just not they will do the revivals every once in a while maybe um i was listening to kaya's um cover uh from oh fuck i don't remember what song it was but i thought it was actually pretty good they could have even actually had like a fourth period with kaya on the vocals if they wanted yeah his vocal style fits the the band i yeah. think although at the same time it kind of would have been sort of like a mix of gagged and klaha in a way and i <laughs> what i do appreciate in malice misery is that all the eras are drastically different from each other both in like stylistically and the vocalists are very different as well. Yeah, that is true. You can tell them all apart in a second. And I, I think it's also worth mentioning the, the projects they they went on after this, just briefly. So uh, after Malice Misery disband, disbanded in 2001, uh, uh, Mana found Moi Oh, the following year, I believe, in 2002, and he's been going with that ever since. We will probably do a more in-depth episode on them eventually, but my on quick take... More. Yeah, I mean, we will probably make an episode about them at some point. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> really? You're really? reloading the idea. <laughs> uh, they're, I'm, they're uh, yeah, popular. I'm just going to say this, not a fan. To be honest, the first two albums, actually, like they have hits... Yeah, uh, they're still like sort of well produced. Mana is already kind of settled onto a sound, and he doesn't budge after that. Like he has his thing. Um, yeah. But then the albums that come after those two, oh boy, oh boy. It's like, very, uh, it's a very consistent band. I will give it that. But it's also, you know, it doesn't progress. It's been going on since two thousand and two, and I would say that the songs are very interchangeable between eras almost. Yeah, but also like the production quality got a lot worse. Oh yeah, that is true as well. I think he 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 lost all the all the corporate money once Malice Miser disbanded. Yeah, I mean I like Yuka actually quite a bit. I especially like the Yuka hits like Monophobia, Nocturnal Romance. They're pretty cool songs. Uh, doesn't touch Malice Miser though. Yeah, that is, that's basically my opinion as well. And I mean, uh, Koji, I think, has the most interesting solo career. It's very difficult to sum up because he has so many different projects. But I mean, his uh, solo under his own name, like Honey Vanity, for example, is a hit and Kisera Sera and stuff like that. And it's definitely a lot more varied than what Mana is putting out. Yeah, Ziz is also cool. Yeah, Ziz and I was... Yeah, yeah. Wasn't he in... In that band with Shuji from Kaligari. Oh, Xavat. Oh, actually, that's even cooler. Yeah. <laughs> As this yeah. came to Europe, just like uh, Moi de Moi did. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, actually, I yeah. think all of them have touched the European landmass at this point. Gact came <laughs> like, with the yellow fried chickens as well. Yeah, I mean, no. I mean, I don't think Klaha has been here. <laughs> oh, right, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, and, and, Unless they and, did like, uh, a shoot of some sort, but I guess they didn't. Yeah, T Tetsu probably hasn't been here. Uh, Yuki hasn't been here, I believe. So, you know, the the theory kind of dies Mana there. Mana took them for Sorry. a holiday, please. <laughs> yeah, let's let's hope that. There was a time he, when they he, could afford it. Uh, yeah. Gotta mention the obvious, probably the, unfortunately, the biggest thing to come out of Mali's misery in a way, Gact's solo career. How do you feel about it? <laughs> I mean, uh, I would say that Gact's solo career... It's extremely successful, certainly, but it's not for me. I, I could I could name like one song from two songs from his solo career. I could say uh, mm -hmm. "Miserable" and "Vanilla," and that's it. Yeah, but those are pretty good songs, actually. Yeah, I mean, I I, I like those two. I, I don't complain if someone puts them on, but I mean, if someone tells me like, "Oh, let's put on Gakt's ninth album or something," I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the uh, first release that he put out immediately after leaving. Uh, Malice Miser is okay. Uh, Miserable is awesome. The other tracks are strange. There's like piano and other sounds. It 
does sound like it's deriving from that Malice Mr. Sound. Actually, there are things even later on that would derive from that sound. Like even a Mars album has like piano, violin, whatever. Uh, I'm not a fan though. He takes this pop singing style very quickly that I also can't stand. So I know there are people who like really swear on those early Gact solo albums and I guess in a way I could see what they like in them, but yeah, personally, not a fan of... I kept up with him, I guess, to a degree. Like, there was that song with the samurai outfit and shit like that. I liked it when it first came out. It's not that bad. Uh, (laughs) Then he started sort of doing really weird stuff. The yellow chickens formed. The yellow chickens came to Europe and a bunch of other places. Uh, I think that wait, wait what the yellow chickens? Yeah. yeah, they're like fried yellow chickens. Yeah, yeah, yellow fried chickens. I oh, don't remember, yeah, that's right. but but I think that we will definitely at some point do a full roast episode on Gakt. I think that would be that would be quite funny. I will not allow yeah. it. He's my honmei. Can I get an explanation of the yellow chickens? Though I'm very intrigued by that. Oh, I wish I could get an explanation on the. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have chicken. no idea. I, I have no idea what went too. into that. All right, so it is what it is then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Then he would <laughs> no. obviously run away to Malaysia after evading taxes in Japan, allegedly. Bunch of other stuff also, very much allegedly, but nonetheless, he's kind of yeah. out of the scene. He doesn't seem to put out any music these days. He's just doing like weird shit on YouTube, uh, fitness videos. Yeah. Uh, some involving genitals, some not. <laughs> oh yeah, he was trying to teach people like how to improve their genital strength or something like that. It was extremely yeah. Like weird. actually, even his sort of general vibe. If you look at those all the interviews from like Japanese talk shows when he's talking about his dick, I'm like, this is so gross. Like that would not fly today. Like if someone did that shit in the West, he would be canceled so fast and for a good yeah. reason too. Uh, he, he's just he's just, just very unpleasant and bizarre uh so that's why these days he's like doing nico nico streams with yohio and mia where they're all like five proseccos deep <laughs> mia and yeah. gacked in bottles and yohio in sips but they're yeah all i have drunk. <laughs> yeah i have to uh just uh, quickly before we uh, wrap up this topic i just want to mention the other guys uh, what happened to them so um uh, Yuki, their bassist, uh, became a designer, I believe, and he doesn't really participate in music at the moment, except for the occasional Malice Miser revivals. Uh, the original vocalist Tetsu became really, how do you say, like disillusioned with the whole goth VK thing, and he became like a straight up rock singer doing very a- average, uh, very Western style rock. In a bunch of different bands, and he was also in the super group Sigso, which I guess is worth mentioning. With some guys like I believe Sakura from Lark and Skell was in there, and a bunch of other guys. He and, went uh, to fucking uh, Uravara Narcissus or something. He was like, "This is enough for me." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's just uh, yeah. Basically, he 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 was happy with that. Just just enough fame to be able to play some gigs. Uh, and then who is left? I mean, Kami died, so he kind of didn't have any career after this. And uh, their drummer Gas went on to uh, Nuclid Romance, and uh, then he also later died. So I guess that sums up all the members yeah. what happened after the band. <laughs> yeah. Well, from that note, uh, but. Did you think about uh, 25th anniversary DVD? Uh, I really enjoyed it. It's um, I didn't have high expectations when I saw it was going to be a bunch of random vocalists doing the uh, doing the vocals for the songs, but then I realized it was their old roadies, so it felt a bit more how do you say a bit more significant. I guess. And a lot of the performances were extremely good. I would say that none of them properly disappointed me. Yeah, definitely. Like, I think as good as you can expect. And it also helped that I liked uh, some of those vocalists a lot. Uh, the guy from Moran, I like a lot. Um, Shuji, of course. It's very cool. From Caligari. Yeah. 
yeah, I think good stuff, as good as you could like reasonably ex- Yeah, and I, and I mean, Ka- Kami Jo, I mean, he did the songs that fit his voice, so I think yeah, it's Kami all jo right. Is Kami jo. <laughs> yeah, Kami Jo is Kami Jo. I can take him in like small doses. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's he, he's he's a very he's very nice voice to listen to in in uh, average doses. Uh, yeah, so I guess that's the most recent thing they did. They were going to do a, another uh, limited style revival at a, an event last year, but it got cancelled due to the coronavirus. So hopefully there will be some more activity coming up in the future. But I think we have now covered this band and from the beginning to today. And so this concludes the episode on Malice Misser. And if you want to buy yourself some sweet, sweet Malice Misser merch, James, where could I get myself some of that? Well, let me tell you about a place called raresut.net. That's raresut.net, not .com. Although I'm told actually raresut.com redirects to raresut.net. So don't <laughs> oh, worry. really? That's <laughs> yeah, convenient for people like me who are uh, URL challenged. <laughs> yeah. And what do they sell there? They sell Visual K, so it's highly topical to our podcast. Um, if you get into like obscure Visual K or like the older stuff, you're going to notice a lot of stuff is on uh, cassette tape and VHS tape, which is super annoying because who has a VHR or a cassette player laying around anymore? But if you buy from Rare's Hut, uh, they'll totally... Mate, you said <clears throat> VHR. Did I say VHR? <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. you did. <laughs> 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 yeah okay Let, let's keep not cut in. this let's let's keep it in yeah so so what what can you do then what do they do with the with the v, v, vhs tapes <laughs> and the uh, VHS cassettes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah exactly well. <laughs> <laughs> uh well rare set offers free analog to digital conversion on any cassette tapes uh vhs tapes or vhr tapes uh if such a thing exists probably not probably not <laughs> <laughs> uh but you should buy that kind of stuff from marisat because they have professional equipment and the expertise to uh convert it in a way that it's going to sound super high quality unless it's like a really old demo tape that is just um bad to begin with yeah like a disclaimer sometimes the quality of the tape is kind of shit so it's they do what they can and it always sounds better than something you could get from somewhere else their gear is pretty amazing like some of the best tape rips i've ever heard yeah especially for vhs tapes as well they look pretty great yeah that is also true yeah and it's also a lot more difficult to rip than uh, than cassettes yeah definitely so yeah if you're into like old school 90s visual k and such i think that's a really good option to consider so you can go to rarisat.com for your VHR tapes. Wait, <laughs> VHS, yeah. uh, VH, VHR tapes. All right, anyway, yeah. rarisat.net. Yeah, yeah, disclaimer, they do not actually rip VHR tapes. No such thing exists. <laughs> it, it was the VHS's uh, lost brother. It's like what Laserdisc <laughs> is to a DVD. Yeah, I wonder if they also rip like Betamax and Laserdiscs and stuff like oh, that. Oh, for sure, like you MD. know it. Yeah, I think they actually have an MD player Do now. They? So if you find some, I think if yeah, I think so. Yeah, they, he does. So if you find some obscure Visual K MDs that you need to rip, you can get them to the, to rare such as well, and they will rip it for you. Wow. You could get floppy on a floppy disk, <laughs> USB drives, you name it. <laughs> yeah, uh, just everything, everything you can imagine, they will rip for you. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I guess. Thank you for listening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wait, wait, wait. We're not done. We have to mention our release schedule. Uh, so uh, this is uh, supposed to come out on the 18th of April. The following Sunday on the 25th, we're having uh, another quiz over at the Rare Sot Discord, where once again, uh, 
there will be some questions, there will be some music to listen to, and we will be talking with you guys if you join in. So, uh, oh, and there's a prize, of course, of $10 in store credit for the winner of the quiz. So I think it's worth checking out. Uh, there's, uh, there's quite a lot of people and it's quite fun. Yeah, and listen, we've got sound effects now, so if you join us, you'll hear stuff like this. Yeah, and this. I think that makes it worth it. <laughs> I love that clap. It's like a golf clap. It's just people standing around cheering like, yeah, hole in one. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get uh, for the winner. Yeah. Yeah, and I might, might just mention that the topic of the quiz is, of course, based on this episode. So it's Malice Miser-themed quiz. So if you listen to this episode, you will definitely have an edge over the competition. So just a hint for those who listen to this. You should definitely participate and try to win some store credit so you can buy that sweet magazine. Yeah, get that Malice Miser magazine that they have there. <laughs> get that Malice Miser VHR. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, and yeah, and hopefully the next episode after this one should be out on the 2nd of May. So until then, thank you everyone for listening and uh, I hope you hope to see you next Sunday in the quiz. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and follow us on Twitter at the VK Podcast. And if you want to help us grow, please give us a five star rating and recommend us to your friends. You can catch new episodes on Apple Podcasts, uh, Spotify, and yeah. all the other places. Thank you for listening, and sayonara. <laughs>